Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association, and welcome to Africa Spotlights. Today, we're taking a look at two upcoming episodes of the popular freeform series, Grownish. To conduct the panel today, AFCA member Jasmine Simpkins. And welcome to this special AFCA roundtable with the cast of Freeform's Grownish. I am AFCA member, journalist, and film critic Jasmine Simpkins, and I'm so excited to be here with you guys today for a very, very special conversation um, with the cast and creators of this beautiful and wonderful show. These episodes are so timely and magnificent. And um, I'm so happy to be able to curate this conversation uh, with these panelists today. We, I will be joined by executive producer and star Yara Shahidi, uh, star of the show Trevor Jackson, star Diggy Simmons, executive producer and director Jennifer Rice Gunzik Henry, writer Des Moran, and writer Wade Allen Marcus. Uh, as you guys know, these AFCA spotlights um, are basically an opportunity to shine a light on unique and important projects in film and television. So we are so excited that you guys all have joined us today. Welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad to be here. Yeah. Well, people weren't probably privy to our dialogue before this got started, but you guys, I feel the love. I feel like as a cast and as a group, you guys absolutely are like a family. Would you agree? Totally. 100%. What is, I always wonder, is there a group chat? Like, do you guys, like, are you guys all on one chat? Do you constantly talk even when, you know, you aren't filming? There are many iterations of the group chat, which can I'm get sure. a little messy at times, <laughs> trying to figure out who's in um, what. Because I feel like we have the massive one and then so many random breakoffs. Yeah. Uh, me and Big have known each other since I was like, you know, 15, 16. So we kind of, you know, we're always talking about stuff. But yeah, and then we have a group chat with the cast. We need to get a group chat with the writers. That would be tough. The writers, we have too many going of our own. We, during, right. Uh, yeah. right. during COVID and when we were at home, we had like the recipe group, the workout group. Wow. We have the regular group. There's way too many subgroups in the writers. <laughs> well, and that's why it's so nice when we get on this and the writers and the actors can kind of get, it's like we haven't seen each other for a yeah. while. And we only really, you know, conversate on set when we get to be on set. And this year we didn't really get to be on set like that. Mm -hmm. So to be on Zoom and see each other like this is nice. Yeah. 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 15 yep. months ago, our worlds were all rocked by this, you know, crazy pandemic. Uh, I want to just first start off with a wellness check. Like, how are you guys doing? How are you keeping your mental health alive? How are you keeping yourself positive and sane during this uh, whole ordeal and experience? You know, it goes it goes in waves. I mean, sometimes you feel like you're you're riding it and things are things are good, you know? It's like, you're, there's so much to be grateful for, especially if you and your family's health is, is doing all right. And, you know, we, we've had the privilege to continue working on this show this entire time, which has been such an amazing gift um, to have through this experience, to be able to talk about all the things going on, to have that outlet of expression. Um, I had a daughter during this time, which was both uh, incredible and also, you know, very sad to not be able to share my daughter, our daughter with, um, you know, I would have brought her around, I would have seen her in family and all those things. So overall, things have been really good, have been really fortunate, but you know, it's, um, it's a journey that's obviously still continuing very, very much so. Yeah, Trevor? Uh, I think this has been a good time to just uh, learn about self wellness, you know, uh, health, working out, you know, sometimes you don't pay that much attention, you take a lot of things for granted just kind of like on the roll. So I think uh, this COVID time is kind of, kind of like, whoa, like really just step up, you know, the way I'm eating, I'm putting in my body. Um, and yeah, just kind of taking better care of myself. Um, and uh, yes, like he said, I'm thinking about my family being healthy and, you know, my castmates and everybody seems to be doing good. And that's always really good. Jennifer. Um, you know, to me, I, I, I think I look at it, my husband and I talk about it. And I think in some ways, it was much needed, at least for our family to kind of stop and slow down. Um, we got to do things that we were never able to do before. 
We have never sat around and done so many family dinners and so much reflection. And so in a lot of ways, I think it put so many things in perspective um, in terms of like just what, what is important? What do we want out of life? Which has manifested in a lot of career choices, in taking leaps of faith, in just really self-reflecting and looking at what, what do we want? Because it was so clear in this space that things can like change in an instant. So I think just my family kept me sane. Um, right now I'm in the process of trying to rid myself of the COVID 20, 30 pounds I've gained. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, I think just kind of looking for the finish line of this thing and adjusting and shifting because I think it really had a, a huge impact on everybody. Yeah. yeah. I think um, it was it was really nice to be able to get back on set and just be with everybody, see everyone. Because by the time we started to film, you know, COVID happened March 2020. We started filming what, like February. Mm -hmm. So by that time, you know, when everything came around, it was just nice to actually be around people, let alone people that you knew really well, because we weren't doing that. We were trying to keep our families safe uh, or whoever it was safe. So um, I feel like set for me, it really served as, you know, something just really nice socially just to be around your people and to show that love. And back to what Jenny was saying too, with just putting things into perspective. You know, I, I live, you know, in, in California, my family lives on the East Coast. So, you know, I speak to my parents every day now, you know, that wasn't a, a thing before. So, you know, you just begin to, to not take time for granted and being able to reach out and, and see people, um, you know, not taking those things for granted. Yara. Yeah, I mean, I just have to agree with what everyone said. I've been so grateful that I've been able to spend the past year and a half with my family. Um, we're super close as a unit. And I think just that reminder of how important it was and how special it is to like and love the people that you're with was ever present. Um, and also, I definitely come from the mindset of having always thought self-care is being selfish. And so this is possibly the first kind of year, especially in my young adult life, in which I prioritized myself actively. And I mean, easier said than done. Um, but it definitely did help in, in larger life shifts about how I want to operate and how I need to take care of myself. And something my mother said that has felt so poignant is that in order to take care of other people to the best of your ability, you have to be taking care of yourself. Yeah. And so I've been trying to keep that in mind, especially with the overlay of not only COVID, but what we're talking about today, too, of just how much this year has shifted how we view justice. <laughs> Yeah. Jazz? Um, yeah, everything everyone has said really resonates with me. I think, you know, for me, especially in the early months, we started writing season four three days before lockdown started. Um, so we went through all of that together and then jumping on Zoom together for the first time. And I think for those first weeks and months, it really helped give all of us a purpose and just sort of like a routine and a regiment, which was so important in keeping <clears throat> keeping me sane in those first few months because it would have been so easy to easy to spiral yeah well let's let's rewind you know and i'll start with you guys uh the creators why was it important to do these episodes obviously during the pandemic the country was thrust into this um george floyd um situation that erupted into protest and everyone's voices were loud um, but did you guys always feel like it was important because black people have been getting killed by the cops for a long time to even put that in the show? Yeah, I mean, I think that when we were in the writer's room, this all happened, you know, I think like Des said, all of this kind of was, you know, <laughs> it just was one thing on top of the next. And I think maybe we would have rather said, oh, let's go back to doing normal college stories. But I think if you know that there's no way you can avoid what's going on, or would it be responsible to turn a blind eye to what's going on? And so I, I think that we, it was definitely some of the more complicated, we had to figure out how to not only address 
the pandemic, but then shift to talk about these social issues. And I, you know, to me, I think it just, it forced us all to kind of dig deeper, you know, it just, it was a rough, rough time, not only living it, but also trying to figure out how to put our characters realistically in this situation. But also it's complicated because we're doing a sitcom where we have to create like this fictional scenario to put them in. But I think, you know, what we ended up doing was kind of taking this amalgamation of stories that our different writers were experiencing and kind of put them all together to do this great kind of mixture of, of what everybody was feeling. And that's really what came out in these two episodes. These are all personal, real stories that were brought to the room from Des, from Wade, from me, you know, there's different elements that each of us really experience in these two episodes. Um, yeah, I think I. Th so, sorry to jump in, but I, I no, think no, when, you know when 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 Amada Arbery when that was first starting, that was kind of the beginning of the dam starting to break. You know, we we were all feeling so boxed in at home. So much of us were on social media more than we had been probably ever in our life. And I think as that started to trickle, it was such an influx from, you know, from us, from, from watching it. And then it continued to happen. And once George Floyd happened, we actually had to take a break. We like broke for two weeks and we're like, we just need to not be on Zoom anymore and take some personal time for ourselves. And I'll let Des kind of talk about as he came in after we came back from that. But it was like this slow trickle that then the dam just opened up and there was no way that we could just not devote a yeah. lot of time to it. Well, I was actually thinking about the timeline of writing these two episodes and breaking these two episodes. And the first episode of Boy is a Gun, we started breaking that before George Floyd. Yeah. That was very much a response to Ahmaud Arbery. And originally we were gonna end it in a different place. And I remember we were having a lot of trouble with the ending of the episode. And um, we came back into the room, we had moved on to the next episode already, but we came back into the room to talk about the end of that episode again, as I was outlining it. And uh, the day we came back into the room was the day after George Floyd was murdered. So we were talking about that in the room. It was before the protests, but it was just more for us. We were just like, have you all heard this, this other story that's just breaking and just started start starting to go national. So like, it was happening all in real time. Like our, our reactions to everything was so just, we, we couldn't ignore it. We had yeah. to put it into the show. And it this was, and it wasn't, it wasn't intended to be like a two-parter. We were going to devote this one episode to police brutality, to, you know, killings of unarmed black men. And then basically it was just like, we couldn't figure out the next episode. We didn't know how to come back to the story of what we were telling, as Jenny had said, of just like being in college. And so that's when we took the break. And I think on the break is when Jenny, you and I got on the phone and you were basically like, I think we need a part two. I don't think we yeah. can just stop at this one place. I think we have to, because the because protests hadn't happened when we, you know, with, with Ahmad. And then we were sort of in the middle of this uprising happening. It was like, we can't just stop here. We have to continue telling the story. Yeah. yeah, which I'm so glad we did because I think it works so, you know, nicely as a two-hander where you start, you know, this character off where Diggy, I think, and I, I feel like that was Dez's feeling when everything was going on. He came in and he said, you know, guys, I'm, I feel like I'm a bad Black person because I don't want to post about this. And it was such an interesting conversation. And that's how all of our episodes begin as organic conversations and what's happening. And Des came in and, and we were like, this is super interesting. And then to see how you're moved to action, you know, how you can't kind of just ignore it. So yeah, I think it, it was great that, that we were able to tackle kind of both sides because I think we are also conflicted about how to deal with this because there's no right way to deal with something that's so wrong, you know? 
For the actors, what was that like emotionally for you guys? I mean, obviously now we're almost a year later. So you guys are now reliving some of this Mm -hmm. feelings and um, emotion from that time to now go back and tap into these characters. And Diggy, I'll start with you because I feel like your character really runs in a a gamut of emotions in these two episodes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like, honestly, it opened me up the most that I had ever been to those topics and somewhat like Doug, and I'm sure like a lot of black people feel, you you just guard yourself. You protect yourself from this stuff. You know, of course you wanna be vulnerable and you wanna let these feelings out, but it's like when that trauma is there, man, and that pain is there, it's like, you don't, you gotta, you gotta move every day. You gotta get up and you gotta do your thing. And it's like, if this is at the front of your mind all the time, how, how can you, how can you not feel suffocated? So it's like, what what is that balance? And that's what I feel like people were really trying to figure out last year. And that I feel like the writers did such a good job of is like, okay, is posting more important than, you know, your mental health, which was another big theme of last year. But I feel like we've become so desensitized to this trauma just because it's thrown in our faces all the time. So now it's like, it's more important um, or more impressive if someone gets a post up first than remembering that this is really personal to people. Like Wade was saying, Ahmad was the first one. And for me to wake up and go on Instagram and see that explicitly as a young black man, like another young black man being hunted down in that way, it's just like, man, I, my, my first reaction isn't to post. Mm-hmm. My first reaction is to like reach out to a homie you know what I'm saying? That also looks like me or, or to my mom, you know? So I, I feel like it was, it was really nice that the director and, you know, the writers were able to come from that angle, man, of, you know, are we just, are we, are we too insensitive to what's yeah. going on? Yeah. Yara, for you. And also I want to tack on just the ish franchise. You guys have always tackled tough issues, but where does this one rank for you? Yeah, I mean, this was such an important episode, I think, because it was also the culmination of how beautifully the writers have explored our characters, because we were able to dive into so many perspectives, and it felt earned, it didn't feel like it came out of the blue, we had a whole Black mental health storyline last season, and so you see the ways in which these topics are of increasing importance to the crew, and to why this matters, and why this would be so central in our group, but I I feel like what these two episodes represented was this kind of evolution of the conversation. You know, for years we've talked about reform, we've talked about the idea of body cameras, all of this. And I think the past year was the first time on a mass scale in which we're saying, you know what, we may have to do away with systems that people felt really comfortable with um, because it's not that the system is broken, they're working exactly as they were designed to. And so to see, especially in the storylines with the girls, that it was no longer about a ton of kids that theoretically believe in the same thing, but we were getting into the nitty gritty of, you can be progressive and still deal with white fragility. Uh, For Doug's character, the idea of you can be thoroughly inundated with this information and care deeply and not know what to do with it. Um, And so I love the fact that it went so far past this idea of just talking about the fact that this is happening in our country, but really leveraging what we know about every character to go into these details that mattered a lot. I mean, even in our own world, being in the television production world, the academic world, I was thoroughly shocked um, to be in spaces in which surface level, I agree with everybody, how much we had to dive into the idea, like, this is about putting your money where your mouth is. This is about being okay, being uncomfortable because as black people, we've had to be uncomfortable and seeing people unwilling to give up their comfort for somebody's life was shocking. Um, And so I I say all that to say, like, I feel like these two episodes were so beautiful because it was like so natural to what we've built already um, and was able to go so far past just an initial conversation about police brutality. Yeah. Trevor. I do want to say thank you to you guys, the creators and writers, um, because you know, I was saying this before, like, you feel overwhelmed and you feel like you may not be doing enough. And I felt like, you know, us together, we did our, you know, due diligence. Um, so just kudos to you guys. Thank you. But um, I think definitely we would dig in terms of 
how much you like try to keep things in. I remember we were shooting the strange fruit uh, scene we were doing and I was like laughing, you know, like in between because I was just trying to keep myself whatever. And I was realizing I was like, yo, like this was a real thing. Like even just slavery in general, like, you know, people like, oh, it wasn't that long ago. It was like, yo, we have to like, I remember when I was growing up, my dad was always just informing me and educating me. And I tried to like shut that part of myself out, but it like opened up like, Dig was saying during that scene, and I was just like, I was like crying. I was like, whoa, like, I really tried to ignore that side of my brain that that existed, like that happened. And then, you know, I was thinking like, you know, the same slave patrol star that evolved into the sheriff star that we have now. And it's like, it's the same thing. So it was really, really, really powerful. And I think, again, it's just making people aware and uh, opening that conversation. But um, yeah, man, it was a lot. It was a lot to deal with. But uh, but I'm glad that we did it. And I know a lot of people feel the same way. And um, I even love the unity between uh, Dick and I's character. Because although we feel differently, like you're saying, that's two sides of the same coin. Like, I was definitely, when all the protests and things were happening, I didn't want to, I felt like a lot of people were doing that for posts and were trying to do things for attention. I'm like, y'all been dealing with this since I was a kid. My dad and I had to leave different restaurants and shit because, sorry for my language, but because of that, you know? So it's like, now everybody wants to be, so, um, but yeah, even like protesting, I was like, I don't know if I would be able to go down there. Everybody deals with it differently. And I think we did a good job of showing everyone's uh, perspective, but it was yeah. powerful, very powerful, man. Yeah, I don't know if we've even talked about the timing of filming this while we were witnessing the deaths of other black folks while we were yeah. waiting on the results of, of charges of cops. And so I think the timing was hyper surreal because we would literally go in to shoot an episode uh, or shoot a scene about uh, knowing whether or not justice was delivered and whether cops were indicted while we were waiting on set for the same information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the final, um, I, I know that the final day of shooting was actually the day that the Derek. Interesting, because we had just broken for lunch and we knew that the verdict was gonna come down any minute. And I know I was like, God, this is going, you know, from a director's, I'm going to be honest, from a director's point of view, I was like, fuck, this is going to make or break this day, no matter what. And it was, you know, we went um, off to have lunch and that's when they announced the verdict. And when we came back, the next scene that we filmed was um, the entire group witnessing the news announcement of yet another death. And so all of the, you know, the cast in that scene were naturally just so emotional after this verdict came in. And I remember, I think I had text, uh, texted Dez and he was like, it's just so crazy that from the day that we started breaking this to the final day of shooting this episode, that it was just watching this all kind of come to uh, an end, even though we know it's not an end, but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I, think, I think that's what has been so strange is like when that was happening, you know, there was something that felt different about the you know the protests and the uprisings that were happening they were happening in white spaces you know seeing melrose getting looted was very different than seeing it south of the 10 like you know when i was a kid growing up in la it was that was a very different thing and i think that's why some of the conversations felt different those white fragility conversations were coming out because I had, you know, a friend of mine who I've known for a very long time who was like, yeah, this is this is serious, but the looting, right? And, you know, that's sort of where that stuff came from. And it was just, it was a strange thing where it was like, okay, so we know the world is already changing with the pandemic. It feels like maybe this is a huge shift in our conversations, you know, with racial uprisings. And yet, unfortunately, it's so evergreen. You know, you see it that when we were shooting it, it's still the same thing. Even now, we feel like we're getting back to some kind of normal that we haven't changed from the pandemic. You know, like our work-life balance hasn't necessarily changed. The way we see each other hasn't necessarily changed, even though so many things have changed. And that's sort of the, the sort of unfortunate quality to be able to like speak about it because it has to be spoken about, but also like you know, fighting against something that feels like it's just, you know, unending. Yeah. 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 It's frustrating. Kudos to you guys. I feel like I've been watching this show from the very beginning and it's so smartly written. One of the things that I do like though, that there's always this balance with like humor and also tough subject matters for you guys as the writers. Was there, was that at the forefront though, making sure, because like you said, this is a sitcom still and it falls in that space 
um, of still making sure that there was still some sort of um, uplifting feeling to it uh, after these two episodes concluded. You know, nothing in terms of the humor, it's, it's not intentional. I think it's situational. And so I think that even in the writer's room, these are very real conversations and debates. And we find the humor in the real situations and then that just kind of translates. So even like I think Wade was just saying, typically, you know, it's rare to see these protests that are happening on Melrose. And I think we have like Jazz who says in one of the episodes, like as long as that, you know, like north of the 10 or something like that. And that came from me being like me and I think another writer, Crystal, being like, you know what, go get them. As long as you don't come in our neighborhood, you We've learned since our last riots and it comes from like a real perspective and that's kind of where we get the humor. Um, and a Javi storyline where Javi actually stops to thank the cops actually came from an experience that my husband and I had right after, right when, when everything was going on, we were sitting in front of a Starbucks and there was um, a, I'm going to just, there was like a, a woman who crossed past my husband and I, and there were also cops who were crossing at the same time. And right in front of us, the woman dressed in her yoga gear and pushing her baby in a stroller was like, um, thank you so much for your service. And I go, thank you so much for your service. And my husband goes, Jenny, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know if we could cuss, but I was like, fuck her, you know, like, she knows the state that we're in right now. And she sees us as black people sitting right here. So it felt like a very definitive decision and statement to see two black people that you know are suffering right now to say, thank you for your service. Now, I don't know these police officers personally, and I am not someone that's going to group an entire group of people together. That's not me. But I did feel like in that moment, it was so insensitive and my husband was the one who was like, yeah, but you don't know what if her husband is a police officer, what if her uncle is, but it, it was an interesting conversation. And so that's what we always do. You know, Des came in and said, I feel like a black person. Wade was like, my white homeboy said this weird thing. And so we come in and we figure out who does this feel like it would organically fit for a character and how can we continue these real conversations? And there's always real humor rooted in all these conversations. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've, we as Black people have always used humor as a tool for survival in the mm -hmm. face of annihilating forces. You know, it's all, it's just something that we need to survive. And so it's, it is, like Jenny said, it's just natural for it to be there in order to talk about it. After these two episodes, where, and you guys can all speak to this, um, where can you tell fans? this season will go from here. Everyone is really excited about seeing your year. Will we see a little bit more of this peppered and infused in? Cause like I said, black people are always um, uh, being done unjustly uh, in this system. Will we be revisiting this topic you think? And uh, what is, what else is to come for senior year? Uh, <laughs> well, this season, I think we do take a shift after this and we start to go into some other, you know, obviously there's other heavy topics that we deal with. I think Anna tackles like an, an immigration DACA kind of situation that we, we explore. I mean, for us, it's, it really is about, you know, trying to maintain that balance of what's really going on. And then also still giving the audience what we know they love, which are those Zoe, Luca, you know, Aaron triangles and what's going on with, with, them in college. So for the rest of this season, I don't remember us going back into that. I don't I, think mm -hmm. so. I don't think we go back to this in particular, but I would say like it the biggest theme I think in, in the senior year season four episodes are really about transformation and change in all of the characters. I feel like you really do see, especially after these episodes, all of the characters start to really shift and change in surprising surprising ways, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree. I think even though we may not touch on these topics directly in the rest of it, there's still this element of, of transformation and having to grapple with the real world after being in this kind of like 
suspended college state <laughs> and knowing that you're all about to head into the world, there are just different repercussions and a different seriousness in which every character has to look at their life. Yeah. For you guys, uh, and I want to throw this out for the male, uh, male so have there been any instances with police that you uh, felt uncomfortable or that you felt really maybe perhaps helped even for you preparing for this particular, these two episodes in particular, Trevor and Diggy? A lot. I'm just going to put it at that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and even not up close, like, just like I said, me and my dad, I, I'll never forget, like, it'll just be different. I remember, okay, one particular story. I was at a, um, a basketball game. My brother had a basketball game at some college in Ohio. And we were there, and there was a bunch of, you know, white kids shooting on the court, like, before the game. And I go on there, and I'm shooting. And one guy comes up and was like, yo, pull your pants up, whatever. I was sagging my pants. But, yo, pull your pants up. Yo, pull your pants up. I'm going to leave my pants where they're at, whatever. And he's like, okay, goes and grabs a cop. Cop is like, you got to move off the floor. And I'm like, all oh, these white kids right here, why got to move off the floor? What are you talking about? And he put his hand on his gun, on his hip. I was like, I said, get off the floor. My dad yelled. I could hear him from across the court. Trevor, get over here now. And I yelled at me. And I was like, what? He was like, come here. And I sat down. And he was like, son. And he was like, this is what they want. This is called provoking. They want they want you to do this. They want a reason. They just want a reason. Please don't give them a reason. I'll never forget that. I was probably like, you know, 10, 12, you know? And uh, so just things like that. I mean, and that's just one of many. I've been in jewelry stores when I was a kid and you can't afford anything in the store. Like just always kind of, you know, felt that. So it definitely helps. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to Trevor's point, especially at the end, yeah, you you go into these certain spaces, especially Trevor and I, as being, you know, we are black, but of course we, we live a, a different life than many people. So we end up in spaces that young black men may not be in as well. Um, so we will, you know, feel that sort of, oh, you don't belong here sort of element or, you know, someone telling me one time about my car, oh, how'd you afford that? you know, um, me being told that some years ago and that's always stuck out to me. So that, and then especially with the, the scene that, you know, Jenny remembers it, it's, it's the end scene of episode five, you know, how heightened those emotions were. And I feel like what got me there was just being very mindful of the, of the families and letting the words uh, get me there. It was so beautifully written that monologue. So, you know, certain key lines, like if, you know, there's a line where I say something along you know, the, the lines of, you know, I say black men, but then I say black women, mm -hmm. you know, and I, in that moment to get me there emotionally, I, I thought of Sandra Bland, you know, it's just, you know, kind of picking out these very specific details and, and going into feelings that aren't only mine. Like I said, like the, the, the families of, of, you know, these, these men and women that have been lost, I can't even imagine with what we already feel, how they feel. Um, so, you know, just wanting to do them justice and everybody who's been dealing with this trauma for hundreds of years. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been such a powerful and amazing conversation. I appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with AFCA about these powerful episodes. I appreciate you writer and directors for um, putting these together and writing these, this, these two beautiful episodes. Um, I appreciate you actors for being able to um, emote such amazing energy and bring these characters to life in such amazing way. I think these are gonna be so powerful for people to watch. Um, and so I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for talking with us today. Uh, as a reminder for all those watching, you can see Grownish on Freeform Thursdays at 8 p.m. Do not wanna miss part one of, these two par of this two-part episode. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal and amazing. And again, thank you guys. You can also rewatch this panel um, on AFCA's YouTube channel and on the Xfinity app. Thank you guys again. Thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.